I'm going to sit back here and adjust that body. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to be up the truck stop. Yeah. 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 How's that sound? Yeah, that sound good? Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Gracious Heavenly Father and Almighty God, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus tonight. We just come thanking you and praising you that we have the opportunity to be together here in your house to see you. Lord, we ask that you just remember these we have called out in prayer. We know that you're ministering to them. These families who are suffering bereavement, Brandy's family and Jane's family. And we ask, Lord, that you just comfort them by way of your Holy Spirit as only you can. And we trust you'll do that for them tonight. We thank you that Lana was able to get home and Teresa was able to get home. Because we know your hand was in both of those situations, made them serious. And we're glad that they're home and that they're recovered and doing well. We continue to pray for Patty tonight, for our sister, and ask you just to keep your hand up on her. And they're believing for a miracle, and we're believing with them. And we're just going to hold that to you, Lord, because we know that, that you're in charge, you're the sovereign God, and you can do all things. And we're just agreeing with them in prayer as they ask you to, to touch her and to heal her tonight. For these we've named off here, for Brother John Aker, Lord, we just pray. He's such a good servant. He does as much as, as any of us can do for you and your kingdom. So I pray you touch Brother John and Janet there at your house this evening and be with them and help them. Lift up Christy, who is Joyce's daughter-in-law. And we pray, Lord, that everything is, will be okay with her. She, she goes through the testing, whatever it is, we just pray it all would be well for her. Pray for Mary. Barbara and Charlie's sister, and ask you to continue to help her <clears throat> and lift up Melinda, Brandy's friend tonight, for us to believe that all will be okay with her. So, Lord, we just thank you. We are humble people, and we come as a thankful people. And that's because we have a God who loves us and cares about us and can do all things. So we put our trust completely in you. Now, God, us through the rest of our evening, dear Lord, as we worship you in our giving, and we worship you in your word. It's in your name, Jesus, we say it by faith. And the saints would say we love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Brother Randall will come. Receive the offering. Now, some churches call it lift the offering. And I don't like the word lift. That sounds like robbery. That's okay. We'll receive the offering. Go ahead, man. No, let's get in the place and not in the garden. I think it's that smoke in the moon. And I forget, you have to go down and you know, make each one of us grateful and enjoy. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Randall. <clears throat> While he's doing that, remember we got the fellowship meeting tomorrow at the fellowship hall at noon. Uh, food, the word, and fellowship, I think. I get them out of order, but. Just remember, there's going to be something to eat, and we'll be there. So that, that's a thing to be. So everybody's invited to that, you know, men and women alike, and everybody in the community. So uh, let's just give somebody a call, and especially the ones that were there the last time. Uh, you know, if we remind them, I'm sure they're probably going to be, going to be a part of it. So we'll, we'll try to get that going again. I appreciate Mary and the women's minister continuing to do that. That's a, that's a great outreach. All right, anybody got a testimony here before we get started? While Randall's still taking up the, taking up the offer. It used to be when the pastor got up, so anybody got a red hot testimony? You would think, oh Lord, he didn't stay really the truck. <laughs> that's not the case, that's not the case. But I, I like to give people a chance sometimes because you know, God's done a lot of, and we can all testify so much. I mean, there's so much that we can tell them that but I like to hear what God, what God has done for all. And a lot of times you don't get to hear that. So go ahead, Mr. Charlie. A year and a month. A year and one month ago, they, they said I wouldn't make it. Wow. And I'm here tonight. Amen. And I thank the Lord every day. Amen. And when I laid up there for seven weeks, don't you think you don't do some soul searching? I bet you do. Don't think you don't look at things a little different. Yes, sir. But I want you to know. I just, I just say, Lord, I need you every day. I need you all the time. I, I, I just say, and I tell the wife, I say, I hear you in there. You say, I'll be all right, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be all right. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it, it's a miracle. He's a miracle. Absolutely. No doubt, no doubt in my mind about that. So, anybody else? Well, Pastor Mike, I was telling you, um, you know, when I walked in that, you know, my uncle did pass away this week, but, you know, through that, we still had a testimony that my mom was able to pray with him while he was in the hospital for him to accept Christ. So, we have a lot more peace now. You do. Yeah. So, we're thankful. Absolutely. <laughs> it comes right down to it. That's what the bottom line is. Isn't it? it is. Yeah, it's always good. Always good to have that assurance. And we don't we don't always know. You know, you don't always know. That, that's up to the Lord to make judgments on all of us and anybody in that case. But it, it's just good it's just good to hear them to hear them say the words and and to know that they trust it. So that, that's always a good thing. Always a good thing. Anybody else? Pastor Mike, I, I thank the Lord for provision. Yeah. And that incorporates a lot of things. Boy, it does. Mentally, physically, financially. I feel so blessed so often. And I feel, sometimes I feel a little guilty. Mm -hmm. And I've thought so yeah. much about those families in Texas yeah. that yeah. have lost all those little children which we know those kids are with Jesus now. But you know, you can't you can't hardly imagine what those families are going through. And yet here we are, so blessed right now in all the goodness that we have. Yeah. No funeral. So I am blessed Jesus. and I thank God for that. Yeah. 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 Miss Hannah was asked <clears throat> to put a presentation together. But if I get this right. State Association of Counselors. Is that what the Virginia State Association of Counselors asked her to put a presentation together on, on the tragedy? So <clears throat> I pray for Hannah. I couldn't imagine having to having to dig into that. And, and to try, she, she's doing that, she's counseling, but still to have to, I mean that's one of it's not, it takes its toll on me. It takes so I just pray that I know she she's able to do that. But yeah, take take a lot for granted. And I uh, were talking outside, you know, not being there in Texas and being right there in the midst of it, it's not as hard for us. I, I used to teach in you know stress debriefing classes after someone would die on a bad car wreck or Someone would get killed. I, I used to go in to squads and firemen or, or anybody. And it's called stress debriefing. And you talk about the situation. And one of the things that we were trained to realize <clears throat> is I would always draw a target on a whiteboard or a chalkboard or whatever I was using. And of course, you had a bullseye, and then you had rings outside that bullseye. And depending on how close you were to that bullseye, that was where the event happened. And depending on which circle you were in, the level of effect that it could have on you. So if you were there in that, it would just be tragic. That whole community was just, just, just can't imagine. They really don't want to imagine, to be honest with you. But we just pray for them. All right, anybody else? Okay, week number 32 in chapter 13. <clears throat> chapter 13 all the way through chapter 17 is going to be action-packed because this thing is starting to take off and get off the ground and move out of Jerusalem. We're going to look at verses 4 through 12 here tonight. <clears throat> uh, my Bible's got a heading that says preaching in Cyprus. Well, that's pretty neat, but there's more than that in that, in that section. So, number four, verse number four. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, Barnabas and Paul, of course, they went down to Seleucia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John, John Mark, as their assistant. Now, when they had gone through the island, went through, covered the whole island, when they had gone through it and went to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, 
a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Azus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. And this man called for Barnabas and Saul, and sought to hear the word of God. But Elias, the sorcerer, or so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he looked intently at him. And he said, O oh, fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished or amazed at the teaching of the Lord. I guess a lot happens right there. I mean, it's covered pretty quick uh, in a few verses. And if you were just listening to that, it would just sound, but you got to remember something. <clears throat> this is the church starting to take off. And these things that are happening are happening as God sets them forth to do in a particular order. Father, we thank you tonight for these who are here for our class and these who have tuned us in. Thank you for them. And now, Father, I just pray as we have worshipped in our giving and in our testimonies this evening. Now I pray as we worship in this word by, by listening to what you have to say to us. I just ask you to open it up, not only in our minds, but in our hearts that it might cause us to see something about ourselves that would help us to be a better disciple and even more help us to be prepared to be better evangelists. And we'll give you the thanks in your name, Jesus. We say it by faith. Amen and amen. All right, on your notes. <clears throat> Saul, who is now called Paul, and that's what he will be called from here on, and Barnabas, along with John Mark, <clears throat> began the first missionary journey into the surrounding nations. You might want to, you might want to somehow make a note, make a note of Paul's missionary journeys. This, this was his first one. This is where he started, and of course he went with Barnabas, or Barnabas and Mark went with him. And the men encounter opposition from a sorcerer. The Romans depended on the magic of these men to protect them from evil forces, which they believed in, but they did not understand. That, that is important to know so that when you talk about this sorcerer and you talk about him running interference between the governor and the apostles, it will, make, it will make more sense to you when you understand the position that these sorcerers had in those, those offices as being part uh, of working under those governors. God will not allow the forces of Satan to stop his message. We know that to be true. And the result is a saved soul. And that is what the word is sent forth to do. There's the bottom line. The Lord wanted Sergius Paulus to be saved. Who, who, was, who was the first Gentile? One of the first Greeks to be saved. One of the Romans. Who was it? He called for Peter, and Peter went and spoke to him and his family. Four Neelius. Four Neelius. And here we have another Roman. Another Roman. And this guy is higher up on the ladder than Cornelius was. He is a governor, a proconsul. The proconsul is just what they use for the word governor <clears throat> of, a, of a particular region or a particular area or not necessarily a whole 
country, but the country divided down just like ours in the states. And they had an emperor over Rio, like a president, and we had governors over states, and they had governors over over different provinces. And that's who Sergio Sergio was. So in verses four and five, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And then they sailed to Cyprus. And when they when they arrived in Salamis, that, that's the port city. They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And then Luke says, they also had John as their assistant. He throws that in there because we want to find out next week that, that he's not going to be with them all the time. So Luke told us this, at this time, John is with them. Mark is with them. And he's telling us that because there's going to be a time he won't be. All right, I'll read notes. Luke says they were sent out by the Holy Spirit, not just by the men. That's the important thing to know. It was not just by the men. Yeah, the men fasted and prayed, and the Holy Spirit said, separate to me, Barnabas and Saul. So Luke makes it a point to say they were being sent out by the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't just, wasn't just something the men that, that were there decided to do. And they were sent to the Greeks. They were sent to Cyprus. And there were Jewish residents there as well. In, in Seleucia, when they got to, to Salamis there, there were Jews who were, who were taken up residence in that country too because what was called the dispersion had already took place. The dysphoria, I think, is what they called it. But the Jews were run out of Rome. I mean, Nero kicked them all out, blew them all go. So they spread out, and a lot of them went to Greece. A lot of them ended up in, in the Greek islands. So they were they were Greek Jews. The Hellenists are what Greek Jews. Remember them? We talked about them. They're the ones that that brought the first problem into the church, didn't they? Remember? They said our widows ain't getting fed. Uh, that's when it all started. Now, the synagogues, the synagogues there became the launching point for the mission. And as I said, Luke tells us that John was, was their assistant. He was, he was with them. I, I kind of view him as being kind of in training because he was Mark, or he was Barnabas' nephew. We found that out last week. And I think they kind of took him along as far as the training mission. He was younger. Than Barnabas and Paul. But I, I don't know if it was of the Holy Spirit that he was called into that, or as now as you would say, he just volunteered to go with them. I don't know. We know Barnabas and, and Paul were sent by the Holy Spirit. But anyway, that, that's where they're at. Uh, that's where they went. Now, verses 6 through 8, when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer. He was a false prophet. He was a Jew, and his name was Bar Jesus. And he was with the proconsul, the governor, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. You, you will be, you will laugh when I tell you what the definition of that is. And this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elias, saucer, or Elias the sorcerer, parentheses, for so his name is translated, Elias. The, his Hebrew name was Bar Jesus. <laughs> he was still seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Paphos was the city of the governor. And that's, that's why I call him pseudo proconsul. Same, same difference. He lived in Paphos. And that's where they ended up because that's where the Holy Spirit was leading them to. Even though they may not fully understood that was going to be their destination, that's where they. That's where they ended up. And the thing about Paphos, there was a dynamic temple to the goddess of Venus, or Aphrodite, as she was called by them. There was a big temple to her in Paphos. And, and that takes into account even more when you think about the sorcerer being there 
And now God sent his word into that area. He sent his word into that. They, they said that Venus came from Greece. They said that's where she, she came down to as a goddess. And they had this giant temple for her, a dynamic temple, is what I read about. And there was a Jewish sorcerer. And it was also a false prophet. Now, just, just read that up front, you think, well, a sorcerer and a false prophet. But that is a lot of information for people who knew about the relationship of these Jewish attendants to Roman governors. <laughs> Why would a Roman governor want a Jewish attendant? Because Rome hated the Jews. I mean, they kicked them all out of Rome. But he was a false prophet. Well, who were, who were the prophets in the Old Testament? What ethnicity were the prophets? They were Jews. Prophets were Jews. So these Jews who came out of the dysphoria, they still had that Jewish ethnicity. That's still, still who they were. So they conned the Romans. That's the best word I can think of. They conned these Roman officials <clears throat> into believing that they could also tell the future because they were Jews. See? They, they would play upon that. That's why when Paul wrote his letter to the Roman church that he made such an issue towards the Jews that just because they were Jews and just because they had the law did not automatically save them under this new covenant. But see, Rome knew nothing about that. I mean, Rome wasn't into religion at all. So the Jews would make a point to these Roman governors and these leaders that they were able to, to tell the future because they were a Jew. And of course, they would no doubt depend on them to do that. But because the Romans was a, was a strange bunch <clears throat> in the sense of religion, uh, they had all kinds of gods that they followed under. Anyway, the Hebrew name of, of this sorcerer is Bar Jesus. And if you, as the late James Moran would say, if you flush that out, that, that name means son of, either son of Jesus or, I said Jesus, or son of Joseph. Uh, because Jesus and Joseph is interchangeable. Uh, the name is interchangeable, so if you don't know exactly which it is, it could have been either one. But Jesus or Joseph would have been his father, not, not the Jesus of Nazareth. And this sorcerer, as an attendant, he was a liaison, a go between the governor and the Jews. More than likely, the Hellenists. More than likely, the, the Greek Jews. Because he could relate to the Jews better than a Roman could. So he kind of, if you want to call it run interference, he, he was a liaison. He, he was a, the boundary, I guess, between the governor and the Jews that lived there. So already conning the Romans that he could tell the future, he would also play that part as a liaison. And, and I, I'm saying all that because... It's in the history of all that, and it's in the history about Rome, how they did that, because all this plays in to the fact of why God sent them back to that, to that point, that main point. Now, the governor, who was Sergius Paulus, in Roman names, it says that he was an intelligent man. Now, you and I, would, would use the word intelligence in the sense of somebody that, that's very smart, you know, is really an intelligent person. But that particular word used for intelligent means that he was liberal and that he was open-minded. That he, <clears throat> he, he wanted to know as much about everything as he possibly could. He, you know, when you say liberal, you, you know, we, we think about liberal as meaning, well, liberty, 
liberty or freedom or, or anything goes. So I guess we could say he was not dogmatic in his particular beliefs as a Roman governor. But, but, he, he was smart enough, he was intelligent in the sense that he didn't, he didn't just take things for granted. He wanted to know as much as he could about everything going on within his, within his jurisdiction, within his governorship. Now that's a good idea. <laughs> it's good to know. So when he heard about the Word of God, now how do you think the Word of God got to him? He had heard about it as a proconsul in Rome. Don't you think it probably started when they started preaching in the synagogues? That, and it spread and it spread and it spread and somebody said, yeah, they're down there. Well, who are these guys? Well, they're preaching the Word of God. What's the Word of God? <laughs> so, go get them. I want to know what the Word of God is. Go get these guys. I want to talk to them. I want to know what it is. He wanted to hear it. And apparently, based on what Luke records here, they got to tell him about Christ. And, and you say, well, how, how do you know that? Because when you look at the verse 8 that says he withstood them, that doesn't mean he stood between them and the governor. What withstood means they, he went up in their face. So they had got to the governor. He couldn't keep them from the governor. He wanted to hear the word of God. So they told him the word of God. But what the sorcerer did, as being the liaison, he, he was opposing everything that they was telling the governor. When they would tell the governor something, he would oppose it. He, he would come against them. He would stand against them on that. Because he didn't want, he didn't want the governor, as it says, seeking to turn, to turn the governor, the proconsul, away from the faith. Well, if he was trying to turn him away from the faith, guess which way the governor was leaving? <laughs> yeah, he, he was he was listening to what Paul and Barnabas had to say and, and Mark with him. And, and this Jewish false prophet saw this happening. And he knew that if this happened, if his governor came to be saved, that he was going to be friends with these Christians and they would find out that he's a false prophet. <laughs> because I, they wasn't teaching Old Testament law. They were teaching what? Well, what was Paul and Barnabas teaching? Christ is alive. Uh, Save Christ is alive. That's the message of the gospel. And it, it would have changed everything for him. So that's from his attempt to turn them away and come into play. And then verses 9 through 11. And then Saul, who, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked intently at it, as our daughter-in-law's mom, Kathy, would say, he gave him the stink eye. He looked intently at him, and he said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately, now remember, Luke's a doctor. And immediately, a dark mist fell on him. And he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Don't you know, that was a hectic moment for that guy. To be struck blind, boom, all of a sudden, be struck blind. Can't see a thing. Not a light. Paul said he wouldn't even see sunlight for a while. Well, Saul was the Hebrew name or the Jewish name for Paul. That's why Luke was calling him Saul to begin with. Because that's his Hebrew name. He was a Pharisee. <clears throat> he was a Pharisee.
Pharisee of the Pharisees. But, guess what? As we found out in the book of Romans, he's also a Roman citizen. So, Paul is his Roman name. Paul is his Roman name. That's why from here on, he's going to be called Paul. Even though he is a Jew, he is still a Roman citizen. Now, using the name Paul among the Romans carried well, of course, with the Romans. I mean, look at the governor, Sergio Paul S. You know, so he could relate to the name Paul. So he carried well with him. The Holy Spirit cannot be outdone. Do not be outdone. This is the mission, and it's going to be accomplished. <laughs> and nobody, no governor, no sorcerer, no leader, nobody is going to stop this word from going forth. It's going to go forth. And the Holy Spirit is the one who sent them. He's in Paul, and he's the one that took this message to Sergio, as I call him. Paul was allowing the word clearly. And he charges the sorcerer with being a child of the devil. Child of the devil, he says. That's what, that's what he charged him with. He says you are an enemy of all righteousness. You know, I, I think that's probably one of the things that that unsaved people don't understand sometimes. I didn't. Because <clears throat> I had nothing against Christ before I was a Christian. I told you I believed in it. Uh, I believed everything the Bible had to say about it. There was a respect there for Christ and for God and the Holy Spirit. But still, I was an enemy of the righteousness of God. Even though I may not have anything against him, he got something against me. And that's the sin that I had. So I, I think I think people think that because you're a good person and you have no problem with God and you have no problem with Christ and you're not anti-Christ and you're not anti-God and you're not you're not against him in, in all this even though you're not saved, you feel like that you're okay. No. You're still an enemy of all righteousness. Because there is no in the food. There, there's, no, there's no common ground between believing in Christ and being lost. There, there's not a middle ground in which you can say, well, I'm neither one. You know? You're one or the other. And and Paul, of course, the Holy Spirit, it wasn't just Paul that knew it, by the way, the guy confronted them about the argument he was putting up against their preaching. He knew that he was a child of the devil and an enemy of all righteousness, which, which of course, he is. And his trickery as a sorcerer, remember, sorcerers do magic tricks. That's what they rely on. Remember the other sorcerer we met in Samaria? And all the people held him up to be somebody because he was a good magician. Remember him, Simon? Remember him, Simon? And, and he was a sorcerer. So this guy was not only a sorcerer, he was a false prophet. He had both offices. So he had a lot of people, a lot of people fooled in that sense. But I, I think of it in this way, the trickster got tricked. And that's about what happened. And, and God did it. God did it for him. So his deceitful tactics and his arguments proved it to Paul. If you look at John chapter 8 and verse 44 in John's gospel, guess what that says in regards to being the son of the devil? These are the words of Jesus. John 8 and 44. Read that for us, team, since you're right there. 8 and 44. You are, the, you are 
of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks it from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So guess what old Elias of our Jesus was doing when he was coming between and standing up against what Barnabas and Saul was teaching and what they were telling the governor and then when he would open up to the governor, guess what he was doing? Lying. Because he's of his father the devil. And, and lying to God would get you killed. And Nice and Superior found that out. God don't take that lightly. <laughs> he, he, he don't put up with that. In, in the sense of, of being mission oriented in what he had sent them there to do. And then guess who put this guy up to doing it? The devil. He was a child of the devil. Anytime we find in this book, and, and Luke don't always emphasize that because Luke has already written his gospel. And he told Theophilus, this is a record of the things that Jesus began to do and, and teach. And then this starts after the resurrection, he follows it through the church. So you don't see Luke, if you want to say, give him credit to everything that the devil does. Now, in his gospel, and the gospel writers do that. They tell us that the devil opposed them. They tell us that he came against it. But Luke just assumes here that when we read that these guys are withstanding the apostles and withstanding the message of God, withstanding against the Holy Spirit, we just automatically know it's from the devil. Because that's what he does. See, he's, he's trying to stop that message from getting out. He, he doesn't know everything. He didn't know if this governor was going to be saved or not, but he didn't want him to hear the message. Because he knew that people that had heard the message had been saved. He didn't want Cornelius to hear it, but he heard it. He didn't want, you know, a lot of people to hear it, but they heard it. And those who have heard it, the majority have come to Christ and believed in him. And Satan don't want that to happen. That's why it's hard for us to testify. That, that's why it's hard for us to witness to people. Because the devil is in a sense, okay, you're, you're born again. You're saved. You're going to heaven. Christ is in your heart. But leave everybody else alone. I mean, and that, that's between you and God. It, it's none of their business. It, it's none of their, leave them to their own. You don't have to tell them anything about Christ. You don't have to share God. You don't have to. That's his goal. That's his goal is to prevent the word from going forth. That's why Charlie D and I were laughing on the phone last night. When, when he said another level, another devil, and I got tickled with that when he said that, he said another level, another devil, and I thought, that's exactly how it is. And then the Holy Spirit said another battle and another victory. And when I heard that come out, I thought, Phew. so I told Charlie last night, I didn't say that, Charlie. I mean, it was my mouth that said it, but, but the Holy Spirit let Charlie know and let me know and let everybody else know, yeah. Another level, there is another devil. And it'll be another battle, but there's going to be another victory. Because the Holy Spirit ain't going to be outdone. And this, this is proof, proof of that. Now, Paul asked him, he said, would you ever stop perverting righteousness? Will you ever stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? That word perverting, even the word pervert, the word means to oppose, to distort, to misinterpret, or to corrupt. He you said you're perverting the word of God. You're perverting all righteousness. Would you ever stop perverting the straight ways of the Lord? 
you ever stop doing it, when you ever stop opposing, when you ever stop distorting it, when you ever stop misinterpreting or correcting the word. There's one thing that we see today is the misinterpretation of the word. That's why it's so important that you be born again when you read the Bible. So that the Holy Spirit can help you with that discernment. If, if your head say that you read the Bible, it'll confuse you. There's a lot of things you won't be able to understand. Because Paul said the natural man does not receive the things of God because they are what? Spiritually discerned. And that's not your spirit discerning it. That's the Holy Spirit discerning it. So if he's the one that makes that in which you know, well, is this right or is this not right? If you don't have the Holy Spirit in your heart, if you're not born again and he's not in your heart, and you hear a misinterpretation, you're not going to know if it's right or not. Uh, I mean, it, it can smoke right by and, and you'll never know the difference. Just like, I believe it was Don Scott told me <clears throat> that the disciples drove a Honda. Because she said they all come together in one accord. <laughs> That's a misinterpretation right there. <laughs> but in all seriousness, if it's misinterpreted, there are thousands who don't know that it is, and they take somebody else's word for it. Don't ever take somebody else's word for it, especially if you're born again. Let the Lord speak to you about it. But because he, he's not going to leave you confused over it. No, there are things in here we, we don't understand. There are things we don't know. But he'll let us, he won't let us believe the wrong thing, even if we don't understand completely what it is. We're not going to be able to misinterpret that and turn it to mean what we want it to mean. That, that's why you hear me say a lot, I'm not a one-verse preacher. Now, sometimes one verse says it all. I mean, one verse can sum up, in a nutshell, you know, the gospel of Christ and what he's done for us, as in John 3, 16. One verse can sum that up. But it's dangerous when you have whole denominations who base their entire doctrine on one or two verses. And that's scary. That's scary. But, but it happens. So Paul said this sorcerer, they were preaching the truth. They were preaching the right thing. And he was withstanding them with his lies and, and his deceit <clears throat> and, and his pervert, perverting the word. As he said, well, that's not true. Or this didn't happen. Or that's not the way it was. And because that was taking place, Paul said... <laughs> Paul said that the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind. Not seeing the sun, but you won't even see any light. Not seeing the sun for a time. And then immediately, Luke said, a dark mist fell on him. And of course, he went about, he went about in blindness. It was the hand of the Lord that did that. It wasn't Paul. Paul didn't say in the name of Paul, I command you to be blind. Paul said, the hand of the Lord is upon me. How did Paul know that? Because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He, he could feel, you ever been around somebody and you just felt, there's something wrong here. That, that discernment, you, you've been around somebody who's, who's angry or somebody who's, who, for whatever reason it might be, and, and you're in the midst and you're around them, and you hear it going on, or whatever it is it might be saying, or maybe a preacher, it may be preaching. And it may be perversion, it may not be the actual gospel, it may be something else. Don't you just get a feeling about that? It just scares you. It, it does when, when, I, when I hear some of the things. When I read some of the stuff on Facebook, 
I'm thinking, where did they get that theology? And I like what Doug Duncan says, the pastor of Harrisburg Church of God. I like what he says, don't listen to Facebook theology. <laughs> That's the best advice you can give anybody. Because it, it is, and, and I see that and I'm thinking, do you realize that God, God sees this? God knows what you're saying? He hears what it is you're doing. So that's what Paul was saying to the sorcerer. You're, you're, not, just, you're not just coming against me or Barnabas or, you know, hand the Lord is on you, buddy. I mean, God's like, he's, he's, going, he's going to finish you off here. I don't know what he's going to do, but he said the hand of the Lord is upon you. And then the Holy Spirit says, oh, strike him blind. He says, you, you shall be blind. And of course, Luke said it happened bang, immediately. It didn't just fade out. It happened immediately. Just try to imagine that for one second. You're, you're in the midst of this big, of this big heated discussion between your governor, who you're running interference for, and these men who are Christians from Jerusalem come up from Antioch. And they're preaching that Jesus is alive. And they're preaching this gospel. And they're telling Sergio all this that's going on. And then he's coming against them. And he's battling against them. And then all of a sudden, he loses his sight. It's gone. And Luke, Luke put it my way when he said he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. I doubt that he was doing that very calmly. I mean, Luke, Luke's not being on, on hyperactivity here, but, but you just imagine that. You imagine that situation. That now, here sits the governor, he's watching it, and here the men are in front of him, and they're all making this, their talks to him. And this guy's coming up against everything they're having to say. And remember, he wanted to hear the word of God. If people have a desire to hear the truth, God will tell them the truth. If they want to hear it. And we're going to find out in this book that people had thought they wanted to hear it, but when they heard it, they said, I will really hear it later. But he wanted to hear it. This leader wanted to hear it. And God gave it to him. So he, he was listening to it. And he was turning to it. And this guy's trying to turn him away from it. And then all of a sudden, Paul tells him, The hand of the Lord is on you, buddy. You're a child of the devil. I mean, it's, it's fighting words. And then he said, but you ain't going to whoop nobody because God's going to make you blind. And all of a sudden, he struck blind. And I'd say he was waving some arms. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like the dark. <laughs> I like blind. If it ain't got a light on it, I can't see it. It's that simple. Uh, I mean, I don't have cat vision. or If a light is not shining on it, I can't see it if it's sad. It has to be illuminated. I, I can't. And, and that's why I'm not comfortable in the dark. You can tell when I work rescue. If I was driving a crash truck and it was dark, every light on it come on when I pulled up on the seat. Whether we needed it or not, I flipped all the switches and all the generators and that truck lit up that whole country so I'm getting out in the dark. <laughs> I ain't going, I ain't going so I, no, this is a deep darkness that came over this guy. And Luke says it did immediately. And in verse 12, Luke tells us why it happened. Then the proconsul believed. That's a big statement. Few words. Then, then. When, then. Now, if you're earlier, he, he was leaning towards your faith. But right here it says, then he believed. When did he believe? I was struck blind. See, words are just words. But God don't work in just words. God works in actions. God makes things happen that just don't normally happen. You know, we, we don't, well, it just so happened he went blind. It just so happened his retinas blew out. It was not a just so happened. 
and the proconsul knew it was going to just so happen. And he saw that these men were telling the truth about Christ still being alive. That's when he saw what had been done. He was astonished at the teaching of who? Of the Lord. So who was teaching? The Lord was teaching. He was using Paul and Barnabas, but the Holy Spirit was making his case the whole time for Christ. And he had the proconsul's ear. He had the governor's ear. And he was wanting his heart. And we don't know where he was at in that, in that I guess, argument or whatever was going on or in that debate that they were having. But the Holy Spirit put an end to it. He shut that dude up. That guy, that guy quit worrying about what they were saying and started worrying about what happened to him. Reagan made a believer out of him. Huh? <laughs> You know, I don't know what happened to the sorcerer. It probably would have been. It would be too. <laughs> Boom. All of a sudden, all of a sudden he was blind. That was proof. The purpose for that affliction was proof that their teaching that Jesus was still alive. Now you're probably going to want to think. Well, how does that prove that Jesus is still alive? Well, think about who's teaching this guy. Think about the man standing in front of him that's talking about the risen Christ. And that's the word of God they're talking about. They didn't go in there and teach theology. They didn't go in there and teach the history of the law. They, they, there's another time to do things like that, but this is not the time for that. They went in there and they preached that Jesus is alive. That's the foundational message of the church that saves souls, is that Christ is alive. Now, why would that be important? Think about the guy that was teaching it. Yeah, he used to be against the Christians. Huh? He used to be against that faith. And what happened to him on the road to Damascus? He was struck blind. Bingo. Bingo. You got, you see, everything that, that's written here, I'm not saying you have to add to it. You certainly have to the Word of God. But some things you can just put together. I mean, you say, well, why would the Holy Spirit, why did he choose blindness? Why would he struck him with bowls? Or why didn't he set him on fire? Or why did he strike him blind? Because Paul was struck blind by the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, you're going to be blind for a time. Because Paul was blind for a time. And Paul didn't see any sunlight for a time. So now the Holy Spirit says, watch this, Paul. <laughs> and now this dude is in the same boat that Paul was in. Don't you think Paul had, had looked at that governor and said, see, I told you. <laughs> see, I told you that God struck me blind. That's how I know he's alive. I saw him on the road to Damascus. I know he's alive. And that guy could have said, well, that's, I mean, that's your word. If you say he struck you blind, I guess he did. But then all of a sudden, boom, it happens to another one. And that governor said, yeah, he's alive. As if to say, don't hit me, Lord. <laughs> Keep it on that dude. Don't hit me. Keep it on that dude. So that, that whole purpose of that whole big event was to win that one soul to Christ. They didn't concentrate on the sorcerer, but it was the governor who wanted to hear the word of God. And that's who we preached to. And that's who we witnessed to. And that's the good thing about this internet. And, and, and every way that we're able to get the word out. There are those who want to hear the word of God. And if they want to hear it, God will make sure they hear the truth. He won't give them a watered down version. He will give them the truth. And then once they hear the truth, then they have to make a decision what to do with it from there. And if anybody or anything comes in between that person wanting to know the truth and someone telling them the truth, watch out. Watch out.
uh, because he's going to make sure that they get the truth. That's the way God does it. Questions or comments? I told you it was going to be action packed. Things are beginning to happen now. <clears throat> yeah. He, these guys didn't play nice with that dude. <laughs> God struck him blind. Now, I don't know how that went. I mean, you probably find it in second history. But I'd say that word spread quicker than the gospel did about that old sorcerer. What happened to you? You ain't going to believe it. I told you. <laughs> now, it would have been nice if he had come to the Lord, but who knows? Who knows? Questions or comments? Good stuff, yeah. Father, we thank you tonight for these who are here and these who tune in. We thank you for this word. We thank you for being like Paul and Barnabas and John Mark and, and Brother Luke who have shared it with us. We can, we can only imagine these things in the imagination that you have given us that we can use even for your glory. We can only imagine what, what may have happened here. But Father, I can, I can say honestly that we have seen your word go forth when we really thought maybe it wouldn't. I, I think we can all say at some point, maybe I'm wrong, but a lot of us can say at some point that we have seen people come to you that we would have never thought would have come to you, that you were able to get that word to them. So our prayer tonight as disciples and evangelists is Father, stir the hearts of the lost, that they might want to hear the Word of God, the true Word of God. Not a watered down, misinterpreted, perverted version, but they would hear the truth of the Word of God. And that truth is simple. Jesus is alive. And because He lives, He saves us. And because He lives, we will live. So help us to concentrate on that, on that message as we take this word to the lost world. It's, it's not about the history. It's not about the theological precepts. It's not about the denominational boundaries. It's about the risen Savior and interceding for lost souls today. Help us to, to teach that. And you, just as you used these apostles that day, you will use us and as we need to be used in those situations that we can be witnesses to. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. All right, I hope you can make fellowship and the word tomorrow. Dude, what's the menu tomorrow? Just our beans and cornbread. Hot dog. No, there's no beans and cornbread. Yeah, all right. Somebody have to bring onions. We'll, 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 we